So uh, yes. first talk this morning is going to be by uh, uh, Elba Garcia Falda from University of Paris, and she's going to tell us about master the master relation that simpli simplifies and frees cumulants. I think it's turned into a verb. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for the introduction. Also, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in this uh, nice event. I'm also sorry that I'm a bit uh, handicapped with um, technology, as you can see, but uh, hopefully uh, the talk uh, should work. So yeah, the I will be talking about this master relation that simplifies maps and freeze cumulants. So uh, at the beginning, I will be introducing this uh, duality between two different types of objects. And we will see three different incar incarnations of this duality. So this will be the presentation. I will be talking about what I consider the three main incarnations of, of this. And then I will be telling you what we will focus on in this talk. So this duality um, that I'm introducing today, that is by the way realized through this master relation that is in the title, uh, appears in three different contexts. So the first one is free probability is probably the one that is more relevant for, for the audience. So um, it's the relation that exists between moments and free cumulants. So, okay, um, probably I, I should not say much about what free probability is. You, you, you people know better than me. But free cumulants are crucial objects in free probability. They allow you actually to define the notion of, of freeness. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I studied quite a lot this duality that exists between these two objects. And then it turns out that my way to approach this problem was through different uh, fields. So uh, my main uh, field of study is around this thing over here that is called topological recursion that I guess is not familiar for, for some of you. So I will say a bit more about this. And uh, I also studied this problem through combinatorics, combinatorics of maps. And by maps, I mean graphs embedded on surfaces. So in this talk, I will focus on the first part, but we will be making some, getting some hints from the theory of topological recursion. So I also want to tell you a bit about this. So in particular, to study the analytic properties that we can study uh, regarding this duality in here, we inspire ourselves by the complex geometry that comes from topological recursion. And uh, we also study many things in here that comes from the combinatorics of maps. But what I will uh, mention less in this talk is combinatorics of maps, because I think many people in this audience already uh, heard me talking about maps. So if you want to ask something about maps, maybe this introduction is, is a good moment. Um, if not, uh, we, I will be mentioning the rest uh, a bit more in, during the talk. So, okay, uh, uh, certain moments in, uh, in free probability can be defined through generating series of these graphs embedded on surfaces, these maps. And what, what I introduced together with Gaetan Borot during the times of my thesis are fully simple maps that are certain maps with some conditions on certain uh, marked faces of the graphs. And these are the combinatorial objects that correspond to free cumulants. Okay, so this duality is analogous to this duality. Actually, it's the same duality. Um, and uh, this uh, duality that exists between these two objects also exists in topological recursion. So let me tell you a bit about this topological recursion in case somebody didn't uh, hear about this. So in uh, topological recursion, we take some input data and we produce some output. And the output usually has some interesting meaning in geometry. So we are usually counting interesting things in geometry. So what is this input data? The input data is called spectral curve. You will be hearing this uh, later as well. And it consists of a Riemann surface, two meromorphic functions, X and Y. And then we have to build a one form on the Riemann surface out, out of these two meromorphic functions. The most classical one is y dx, but there could be other possibilities. And then we also have a b differential. I don't want to say too much about this, but this is quite a universal object. 
And actually, you will be seeing it appear in the talk a bit in an uh, in a covered way, but uh, I will mention it later. So this is kind of a universal object that is attached to the Riemann surface, but there could be also some choices. And it's just a bit differential on the Riemann surface. So once we have this uh, data, so you can see here a zero and a one. So we have these multi-differentials that are uh, indexed by two indices, one that refers usually to some genus and one that usually refers to some insertion points. So we need to start the recursion. We need uh, the 0, 1 and the 0, 2 data. Then we can run the topological recursion, which is a recursion on 2G minus 2 plus N. And we build these multi-differentials omega GN that very often count important things. Um, okay, so what is this uh, duality in this context? So it turns out that uh, here I'm not even writing the formula of topological recursion. So if you haven't seen it, you cannot maybe appreciate, but it turns out that X and Y play very, very different roles in this recursion. So if you see the formula, uh, it's uh, you're producing these multi-differentials as a sum over ramification points of X and then quantities that have to do with omega zero one. So they also have to do with Y, but they play completely different roles. So one question that appeared since the beginning of topological recursion is what happens if you extend the role of X and Y? Because in principle, I just told you that they are two meromorphic functions. So you could wonder, ah, okay, what if I take them reversed? Well, it turns out that you can also get multi-differentials. And it turns out that there exists a relation between one topological recursion problem associated to a spectral curve given by X and Y with this order and uh, another topological recursion given by Y, X with the reversed order. So here I didn't write Y, X. I wrote uh, X hat, X check, Y check. And it's because in general, we are uh, uh, interested in more general transformations than just exchanging X and Y. And they are called symplectic transformation. So what I call symplectic transformation is just a transformation applied to X and Y such that this two form is preserved up to, up to sign. So you can see that if you extend X and Y, here you are gonna get dy wedge dx, which is just dx wedge dy with the reversed sign. So in particular, the transformation that extends X and Y is a symplectic transformation and is the most mysterious one for us. Okay. So this is a presentation of, uh, of the three incarnations of the recursion. Now uh, I'm gonna give you a bit more context. Are there some questions so far? Yeah, maybe it's a bit hard to with the online talk to, to get questions in the middle of the talk, but um, yeah, if I will continue. Question, yeah, get my attention yeah. and I'll uh, pass the microphone along. So yeah, but yeah, okay, perfect. attention first. Good, so. If there are questions, just, just tell me. Um, okay, so I wanna say a bit more about the history of, uh, um, of these uh, three, how these three contexts got related to each other. So at least uh, I can say uh, quite a lot uh, since I uh, started my thesis. What happened before, uh, I, I studied it, of course, but probably some people there know more about what happened before. But uh, okay, this, uh, this uh, story started actually here. So we, um, so I was doing my thesis with Gaetan Borot and he proposed to me to study this relation between moments and cumulants that had been studied by Collins, Mingo, Snyadi, Speicher for the second order. So uh, the first order relation between moments and cumulants was already given by Voiculescu, as you, as you all know. And uh, they extended this relation, this r transform relation to second order um, moments and cumulants, free cumulants. And it turned out that they didn't know uh, how to get this relation for higher orders, higher order than, than two. Um, but they had already introduced free cumulants for higher orders. So this is what, what had happened here in this paper to, in 2006. 
And uh, Gaetan proposed to me, okay, why don't we study um, this duality, this uh, moment cumulant relation, but from the point of view of combinatorics. So it turns out that you can build some moments out, out of the generating series of these embedded graphs, so these maps. And uh, we defined these fully simple maps to match the cumulants here. So this is what we did uh, in 2017 uh, with Gaetan. And then it turned out, this we were not expecting, but it turned out that we could also build matrix integrals for these maps and for these fully simple maps. And we could relate these matrix integrals using Weingarten calculus. And we found a relation uh, that looked quite um, universal and, and quite nice. We saw some ob objects appearing uh, to transform maps into fully simple maps. And these objects were monotone Hurwitz numbers. This relation, you will see it uh, very well during the talk because it's the master relation. Um, okay, so we related this context from matrix integrals to Hurwitz numbers. Then it turned out that you could also do the opposite. So what we did was going from fully simple maps to maps through a certain type of monotone Hurwitz numbers. But there is also the opposite relation. You can also go from maps to fully simple maps with what is called strictly monotone Hurwitz numbers. And in that relation, you don't have uh, alternating signs appearing. So with, we thought, okay, probably one can explain this relation combinatorially. So this is what we did in this other paper with uh, um, Gaetan Borreau, Severin Charbonnier, and Norman Do. We proved this duality between maps and fully simple maps through monotone Hurwitz numbers using combinatorics. Then it turned out that this uh, combinatorial shape of the duality um, could be transformed quite easily into uh, semi-infinite wet um, language. And then this um, brought, uh, this led all these people, Bitskov, Dunin, Barkovsky, Kazarian, and Shadrin in 2021 to actually prove that fully simple maps satisfy topological recursion when you extend X and Y. So it turns out that we know that maps satisfy topological recursion for a certain X and Y. And if you extend X and Y, what you're gonna get on the other side are fully simple maps. This was a conjecture during my thesis and we had a proof that was conditional to some things happening that have to do with the theory of topological recursion, but we didn't manage to prove it without this condition. And then it was inspired by this combinatorial shape of the duality um, that you can write it in the uh, Fox space formalism. And this led to this proof in 2021. Then completely independently with uh, Gaetan Borreau and Severin Charbonnier, we also managed to prove that fully simple maps satisfy topological recursion when you extend X and Y using some more general combinatorial objects that we had introduced in a previous work. Um, with uh, Severin and Charbonnier to study some certain uh, type of intersection numbers on the moduli space of, of curves. Okay, so we got two different proofs of this relation between these two contexts. These, of course, help us relate the other uh, context. So we could also relate directly topological recursion to the duality through Hurwitz numbers. So the symplectic transformation through the duality through Hurwitz numbers, and also topological recursion directly to free probability. Okay, but there was still the question missing, like, is it always true when you define free cumulants in the generality that were defined in the Collins, Mingos, and Alice Piker paper, is it always true that this duality is realized by these Hurwitz numbers? And in particular, can, can we use this to solve the, the open problem that uh, that they had posed in this paper. So the open problem was to relate moments and cumulants. Um, so to, to have the general R transformed relation between moments and cumulants. And this is what we uh, managed to solve using uh, a bit the techniques that we had learned about in this paper and in this other paper. Uh, in this uh, joint work with um, um, Gaetan Borreau, Severin Charbonnier, Felix Light, 
uh, and uh, Sergei Shad. So this is the work that I will be talking about in this talk. Uh, I will also tell you about some new developments since then uh, that are ongoing work. So, okay, this is the presentation of the context. Now I will focus mainly on this part over here. And as I said at the beginning, I will also get some inspiration from topological recursion to give analytic properties in here. But we will forget a bit about the combinatorial part. We will just, we can keep it in mind because uh, it's nice, but, uh, and it may help understand some things, but that's it. Okay. Uh, ah, sorry. Okay. I also mentioned, I, I forgot to mention a couple of works. So there was already a hint by in the paper of Golden Gay Pake Novak in 2011 of this relation. So there were already some uh, monoton Horvitz numbers appearing. But okay, finally, we, we understood that actually this is completely universal and that we can use this to get the moment cumulant formulas. And there was also uh, a direct relation uh, in here that was uh, made stronger. So in, in, uh, in this paper, we conjectured that actually every time you define this uh, um, type of duality between two types of, uh, th of things, so if you have certain moments, you can define cumulants in terms of them or the other way around. So every time you have such a thing in general, you can uh, write it through Horvitz numbers. Okay, this we, this we knew. Uh, but it what we conjectured in this paper is that this always corresponds to exchanging X and Y in topological recursion. And this is what was proved in this uh, paper in 2022. Okay. So uh, now I will present the uh, master relation in its universal shape. So I want to start by defining double monotone Horvitz numbers. So they are just uh, numbers. So we denote them like this, HK, uh, Lambda, Mu. Lambda and Mu are just two partitions of D. And these Horvitz numbers count the number of possibly disconnected coverings of the sphere. With uh, so here I, I I attempted to to draw this thing. So we have here our Riemann sphere, we have our zero and our infinity, and we have some other points. So uh, we want to fix lambda and mu. So lambda will be the partition that gives us the ramification profile over zero. So what do I mean? What what I mean is that we should see we're we're counting ramified coverings of this sphere. So we want to fix how many sheets come together uh, at every pre-image of zero. And we do the same for infinity with, with mu. And then K just tells us the number of simply ramified points. So basically we have two points. This is why they are called double Horvitz numbers in which we consider these uh, generic ramification profiles, but fixed. And then K other points. So these points in, in here, we need to have K of them in which we have simple ramifications. Okay, and here you can see that, uh, so what I mean by simple ramification is that only two sheets come together. That's why I, I drew it like this. So these are the other sheets that are not ramified. And these are the two sheets that come together. And here I attempted to, to draw the um, crosses. So the, the two sheets coming together in some kind of, with some kind of order. Well, this is because I want to, uh, look, I, I want to actually um, care about monotone Horvitz numbers, and it will have to do with some monotonicity condition on these transpositions here. So why do I call them transpositions? Because you can also uh, compute this. So these double Horvitz numbers, by definition, they are number of uh, possibly disconnected coverings of the sphere. But you can also count them by counting uh, um, certain tuples of permutations. So, okay, here I use this notation. C lambda is just the conjugacy class in the symmetry group of the, the elements uh, of elements of cycle type given by lambda. So lambda prescribes you the number of cycles and the lengths of the cycles. So these uh, Horvitz numbers, they also count tuples like this in which the first um, permutation belongs to this conjugacy class. Uh, fixed by, given by, uh, uh, labeled by lambda. 
Then the others are actually just transpositions. That's what I mean by uh, they have cycle type two one 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 one. So those are transpositions, and then the product is has a cycle type given by mu. Okay. Now I want to tell you what I mean by this monotonicity condition. Well, I mean if I write the transpositions like this, in which a is strictly smaller than b, then uh, the b's will be uh, an increase, uh, any uh, weakly increasing sequence. If we have this, then we call them weakly monotone orbit numbers. They were introduced by uh, Gould and Gepak and Novak in this 2011 paper. Um, and uh, when we have that this uh, form a strictly monotone sequence, then we call them strictly monotone orbit numbers. Okay. And we want to package these numbers into generating series. Um, so we just take a sum over all possible case, so all possible number of simply ramified uh, branch points. And uh, we just attach an H bar to the K for each K to keep track of the case. And here we just attach minus H bar to the K. So this is this sign will be the source of those alternating signs that I was mentioning before. And the little uh, remark is that here you have a, we have a power series in H bar, and here we actually just have a polynomial. And this is because when we have a strictly monotone sequence, well, there is a finite number of uh, strictly monotone transpositions that you can build if you fix D, of course. And that's why this, this will stop. Okay. So now we can actually present this master relation. So I want to introduce what I call topological partition functions in general and what I call master relation in general. So <clears throat> I will be calling Fox space just the completion of the ring of symmetric polynomials with coefficients formal uh, series in H bar. So we just have infinitely many variables that we call P1, P2, P3 like this. We will actually consider uh, um, P lambdas labeled by Young diagram, so by, by partitions. And when we write this, what, what we actually mean is just products P lambda one, P lambda uh, length of the partition. Um, okay. And then we also want to consider, uh, so this will be the, this will be our coefficients, but we actually want to have power series in H bar. And this H bar will morally take care of the topological type. That's why they are called topological partition functions. Okay, and we also want to consider these combinatorial factors. So we take products of lambda i's and then products of uh, multiplicities, so uh, factorials of multiplicities. So by multiplicities, I just mean mj lambda is the number of j's that appear in, in lambda. So those guys will appear in our uh, formulas. And you can see that they are some kind of uh, factorial, uh, so uh, combinatorial uh, factors counting types of types of uh, um, transpositions. So a topological partition function is just an element that lives in here. It's of the type exponential of something. And this something has this topological expansion that looks like this. So it has h bar to the 2g minus 2 h. Okay, and uh, we actually want to consider that we expand this exponential. We fix uh, each power of h bar um, associated to each uh, partition. And then we call this coefficient z of lambda. Okay, now we can say that two topological partition functions, z and z check. So we will also be in this talk, I will also be denoting uh, with check the problem that uh, appears by duality. And uh, we say that these two uh, objects satisfy the master relation if they are related by such an equation. So you can see that here in the middle, you have these strictly monotone Horvitz numbers. And here you have lambda, and here you sum over all possible partitions of the same size of lambda. And here you have mu appearing that is varying. And here you have the double monotone Horvitz number that has lambda and mu. Okay, and it turns out that there is also the dual formulation of this relation that is equivalent to this one. And it's just because these two Horvitz problems are kind of dual to each other. 
Okay. So Elba is should we be thinking yes. of those things as the uh, more ge the generalization of the usual moment cumulant relations is that sort of the idea that one of them is supposed to be moments and one of them should be cumulants and one of them and we have a Mobius function and a zeta function to tell exactly. to go back and forth between the two Exactly so okay. later you will see the the exact relation but uh, morally, this is what you should imagine. So in uh, here in one side, you have one of the type of problems and on the other side, you have the other one. Usually I will co be calling the one without check the moments and the one with check the free cumulants. If you're in combinatorics, this will be the maps and this will be the fully simple maps. If you're in topological recursion, they are related by extending X and Y. But this is actually more universal, it works for many, uh, so so for a very very um, uh, general object that is this topological partition functions. But morally, you should imagine it like that. Yes. Thanks. Okay, and uh, actually here you already see the objects that appear in free probability appearing as well. So we have that the information given by our topological partition function is equivalent by the information encoded by uh, multiplicative functions on the poset of partition permutations. This poset of partition permutations, many people know what, what, what it is. Many people, I mean, uh, some people that introduce it are there, like James, Jamie. Um, uh, but if not, I will be introducing it uh, in a moment. So this information can be encoded either by topological partition functions or by, by multiplicative functions. It can also be encoded either by topological partition functions or by, by endpoint functions. So we can also fix the G and also the number of, of insertions. If you fix those two, you build generating series of just these numbers. And these are the numbers that are also uh, in here. So you can build uh, either this type of objects or this type of objects. This is what I mean. And these three types of objects encode the same information. So the open problem in free probability is, can we find the relation between moments, the generating series of moments and free cumulants? And here I'm putting G equal to zero because in uh, free probability and in, in, and in higher order free probability in the Collins, Mingo, Schneady, Spiker paper that, that I mentioned, um, they had only defined these free cumulants, these higher order free cumulants uh, corresponding to genus zero. What we do in this work is we solve this problem, but by just solving it for uh, general uh, genera. So we put here general G, we manage to find this relation. And when it specifies to genus zero, it, uh, um, it gives precisely the moment free cumulant relation. And uh, with uh, this, uh, um, more general result in mind that we find a relation between uh, these guys with with uh, general genus. Um, we actually defined this notion of higher genus corrections in free probability that I want to talk to you about. So this was known. This moment cumulant relation was known for n equal to one and n equal to two in free probability. Also in combinatorics of maps. This is uh, what I proved uh, for uh, general maps in my thesis. And for n equal to three, it was known in the context of topological recursion. Uh, but now we know it in general, and I will explain a bit how we prove this. So the strategy is to show that this master relation that I introduced at the beginning can be uh, written. So we know that the information that is encoded by this topological partition function can be also encoded by a multiplicative function on the poset of uh, partition permutations. Well, how do we encode the relation? Well, the relation is just, we actually consider the multiplicative function that encodes the same information as this, this Z check. And taking here the convolution, I write this, this circle because here I also want to, uh, so here I have general genus. And this will be an extension of the usual convolution to account for general genus. And you can do it for higher genus for free. And if you specify h bar to zero, you recover the planar case. So you recover the usual convolution. 
But it turns out that this master relation that I showed you that is very general can be encoded also in a very general relation like this that looks like the relations that appear in free probability. So basically, you take a convolution, this extended convolution with a, an extension of the zeta function that I will introduce, and you obtain the guys that give you the moments. So these are usually the guys that give you the free cumulants, and these are the guys that give you the moments. OK, then we also prove, so this, this is what we prove in, in, in our work. What we also prove is that this relation is also equivalent and here I didn't I didn't write the relation explicitly. Here the relations are completely explicit, by the way. You don't need more details. Well, maybe you need the definition, of course, but once you have the definition, this is pretty straightforward. But here the relation is a bit more complicated. You will see it later. Um, but we have an explicit relation between these uh, endpoint correlators and these endpoint correlators for any genus. And well, it turns out that since two, this is equivalent to this, and this gives us in general the definition of higher order free cumulants and also higher genus free cumulants in this case. And this is equivalent to this. Well, we obtain, we solve the problem that was posed in free probability. So for any uh, cumulants that you can define at, out of some moments, you can find the R transformed relations. Okay. So this was a bit the setting. Now let me go to some details. So uh, I'm calling this surface free probability because as I told you, uh, we managed to solve this, pro this problem for uh, higher genus. So objects with higher genus, because we are using tools that come from the world of topological recursion of combinatorics. And there you always have in a very natural way surfaces of higher genus. So, um, this um, inspired us to introduce this surface free probability. And actually, the inspiration was there since a long time. The, I guess the question was like, is this, free, is this uh, higher genus uh, free probability going to behave in a nice way? And what we actually proved in this work is that it does. It behaves in a nice way. So it deserves its own uh, name. And we can, uh, we can actually compute all the corrections that, that we want like this. So you will see also uh, a very explicit example a bit later. So, OK, uh, let me introduce first the partition permutation from the work of 2006 that I was mentioning before. So these guys are just uh, pairs in which we take a set partition of the set 1 to D. And we also take a permutation. And we want that the permutation is included, in some sense, in the uh, set partition. So what do I mean by this? It's much easier to illustrate it with an example. Here we have a, a set partition uh, for d equal to 9. So it just consists of these two blocks. So uh, And here we have our, um, our permutation. And it satisfies this property because if you forget about the cyclic order of the cycles, uh, you can see that the blocks are completely included in the blocks of the of the permit of the partition. So I mean that one, two, three is included in here, and also four, five is included in here. This this would not be true if, uh, for example, five was in here and four was in here, and I consider this cycle. This would not be okay. It would not satisfy this property. So this is what I mean. Then we also consider <clears throat> the length. <coughs> sorry, the co-length of a partition permutation that is just giving, given by D plus the number of cycles of the uh, permutation minus twice the number of blocks of U. And this is always bigger or equal than zero. And for example, if you take the um, biggest possible uh, set uh, partition, so it's just, uh, sorry, is this the biggest possible? You meant the smallest. No, it's the smallest possible. Yes, exactly. So here we just consider uh, D singletons. And that's why it has two D, uh, it has D blocks. And here we have just the uh, permutation that is given by the identity. So it just have D cycles. So in this case, we have this is equal to zero. But you can uh, check that because of this property here, this will always be bigger or equal than zero. OK. And then we consider, uh, we can consider products 
in in here in this set of partition permutations and uh, this is all in this paper but we will just generalize this by removing this condition and keeping track of how uh, far we are from satisfying this condition with this h bar is with what will give us the notion of the genus okay so here the product of two guys is just given by the join of these sets so we just consider uh, um, the smallest possible uh, partition that contains u and v. This is the join of, of u and v. And then we consider the product of, of gamma and pi. And uh, in this paper, they consider that this is equal to, the product is equal to this if this condition is, is satisfied. And if not, it just, uh, it was forced to be zero. And this is what enforces this planarity. Okay, now we review what the convolution is in these partition permutations. It just, uh, so we take uh, two functions on uh, PS. We take their convolution, uh, evaluate it in U uh, gamma. And this is just the sum over all possible uh, factor factorizations of uh, U gamma, like this. And then F evaluated at this times G evaluated at this. Okay, this is the convolution. And then we have three special functions. We have the delta function that plays the role of the identity, if you want. Uh, this will uh, almost always be zero. It will only be one if this guy is the smallest possible um, set partition and this guy is the smallest possible permutation. And then the zeta function uh, will also give one in this case over here. But it will be uh, it will give one in in some more cases. It will also be, give one if the um, if we take the permutation, we forget the cyclic order, and if we then get the same as the set partition, then this will give one. So we cannot have a strictly smaller permutation, otherwise it gives zero. This is it. And then you can prove this. Uh, you most of you know it very well, I guess. Uh, you can prove that uh, there exists a unique function which gives you the inverse um, by convolution of the zeta function. And in, by inverse, I mean that the convolution will be equal to delta, which is our unit. Okay. So now we can, uh, we can uh, explain better what the pro open problem is in more uh, details. And then we can extend all this story. Uh, so we take here uh, functions that are multiplicative. It just means that these type of guys depend only on the conjugacy class of, of gamma. And then uh, since we have this property, well, we can consider this, this type of coefficient. So we just take F evaluated at the, now, it's, now this is the biggest possible um, partition. So it's the partition in which uh, everything is, is in there in one block. And then we have here a permutation that is factorized into these uh, n cycles. And each cycle has length li. So we encode these numbers like this. So yeah, they are numbers because this is f evaluated at this type of uh, partition permutation. So we have phi a multiplicative function. And we want to define kappa. So uh, in a higher order probability space, phi will be given just by the moments of the higher order probability space. And we want a way to define the free cumulants. And the way to define it is just like this. So um, the moments are related to the free cumulants through convolution by zeta. And uh, as we saw that it exists, there exists a, a, a mu that gives you the inverse of this. You can also define kappa like this. Okay, and this is equivalent also to a sum over non-crossing partition permutations. Um, so we can encode all these numbers into generating series. Like this for n equal to one, we just get the generating series of moments and the generating series of cumulants or free cumulants. Um, and in higher order, you just encode them like this. And I'm, I'm calling them mn and cn. For the moment, this is just the, the old story. So that's why there are no genus. Everything is in geno zero. And the open problem is what is the functional relation between these two guys? Okay, so now you know the details of this. 
I already anticipated a bit the story, so I will I will be a bit fast here, so I can give a bit more details about the new part. So for n equal to one, this relation, this functional relation, was found by found by Voiculescu. Then it was uh, proved combinatorially uh, or uh, or extended to combinatorics by uh, Speicher. Then for n equal to two, as I mentioned before, uh, it was proved by Collins, Mingo, uh, Sniadi, Speicher in this 2006 paper, where they also introduced higher order free cumulants and higher order um, probability spaces that I just showed you. And also these partition permutations, all that was introduced in this paper. Uh, so it turns out that for n bigger or equal than three, these proofs over here are too hard to generalize. So uh, we tried to generalize them using combinatorics of maps. Turned out that it was also hard to generalize them like that. So we proved uh, those relations from combinatorics of maps for n equal to one and two, as I mentioned, and for n equal to three from the theory of topological recursion. But what happens in general? Um, well, this is what I will uh, explain in the next uh, part of the talk. Um, but let me first tell you a bit more about this um, surfaced free probability. So we consider a higher order probability space. So we have some algebra and some moments given by this uh, type of linear functions. We decorate them. Um, we decorate the partitioned permutations with elements of the algebra. And moments will be multiplicative functions that look like this, with these decorations given like this. So the moments are the phi ends, and they allow us to define this type of functions on partition permutations. Sorry, this should be a bigger thing, should not be a subscript. Um, so we can define free cumulants like this, as I anticipated in the previous slide. And we can also define higher order freeness by saying that uh, some uh, algebras are free if the mixed cumulants are equal to zero. OK, here you have the, the precise uh, definition. Um, yeah, if we consider that the moments are uh, zero for n bigger or equal than two, of course, we recover first order freeness. Otherwise, this theory would be too strange. And uh, we have uh, that uh, in the same way that classical cumulants linearize adding independent variables, free cumulants linearize adding free variables. OK, this will be very important for us later. So OK, let me go to this extension, this surfaced free probability. So we have to extend the multiplication that I just told you about. So the way to do it is just we never impose that is 0. It, it will always give us something. And this, uh, um, how far we are from the planar case will be encoded by some genus that we will introduce. Uh, this extended multiplication can also be understood as multiplication on something called surface permutation. So there are two ways. Either you take the usual partition permutations and you add some grading by H bar, and this keeps track of the genus defect, or you define these new objects that are surface permutations, and they will already carry some genus. So I, I decided to introduce only one of the two things in this talk, and I will go for the for the grading with H bar. So here you have an example in which you take uh, um, these two partition permutations. So okay, the the yeah, you can see that the here the sets. Uh, the set partitions are just the same as the permutations for getting the cyclic order. So if you take the product, you will obtain something like this. This is uh, perfectly fine already with the non-extended multiplication. You can multiply because if you take uh, this co-length plus this co-length, you can do the computation. It will give you exactly the co-length of this guy. So what happens when this breaks? And well, this happens here, for example, if you just modify this partition permutation a little bit. Now you take the new set partition that just puts together all the uh, these two guys. And in this case, you can see that there is a discrepancy between this co-length and this co-length. And well, it turns out that if you do the product on these surface permutations, 
this amount to considering here a higher genus object. So it amounts to considering these as a, instead of a, a well, it's a surface permutation, but where you all also allow this higher genus. And this was already hinted, uh, by the way, in the in the original paper, Collins, Mingos, and Alice Parker, in the appendix. They already tried to do something with these surface permutations. Just now we, we, we managed to show that everything works well and that everything makes sense. So, okay, one has to consider this extended multiplication by removing the planarity condition. You also have to extend the convolution. It's just by extending, the, but by writing here the extended multiplication. You also have to extend the zeta function and the Möbius function. To extend the zeta function, you just add here an h bar to the co-length. Sorry, not to the co-length. To, yeah, to the co-length of the of the um, permutation. So it's just d minus the number of uh, blocks. And uh, you keep track of these guys. So now you will have functions that don't go to C, but they will go to power series in H bar. So you will have this grading. This grading will keep track of you of the genus defects. And this will allow us to introduce a notion of GN freeness. So in exactly in the same way as before, we introduce, so now we have uh, some moments that can have higher genus. We can introduce, uh, um, higher genus uh, and higher order genus free cumulants by the same relations as before, because we also have, we can also prove that there exists an extended Möbius function like this, which is uniquely determined by these relations. And now it is obvious uh, how you can generalize this thing. I mean, no, not completely obvious, but you can uh, show that, that everything works well. It's just by saying that, uh, so you will say that something is G and freeness if all the mixed uh, G and cumulants for G and smaller or equal than G and, so there is there will be some order in these pairs, but that is kind of like obvious, the order that you should put. And if all the smaller or equal ones to G and are equal to zero, the mixed uh, cumulants, then you will say, say that something is of order d n free. Okay, and this allows us to extend the uh, important result of, of Voiculescu for first order. So it turns out that if you have two ensembles of random matrices of size n uh, in the presence of uh, unitary invariants for one of them, and both of them, so for fixed n, they are independent, then if they uh, um, tend to something uh, up to up to a certain order so okay the the this has to make sense up to a certain order so they allow some topological expansion up, up to a certain order this is what i mean then they will be asymptotically free these two ensembles and what does that mean it means that the limits will actually be just free random variables of order, and this is the important new part, uh, G0 and 0. So if the uh, uh, topological expansion existed up to order G0 and 0, then you can say the limits exist, uh, the limits are free of order G0 and 0. And this allows us to control, sorry? Do you mean you only consider moments up to that size? Like you only look at moments, like in finite freeness, you only look at moments of a certain size. You don't worry about higher moments. Yes, exactly. So, but in, in many, many important cases, this will be just, uh, it exists uh, for all orders. And then this, this we can say that this, they are, the, the limits are free for all orders. Okay, thanks. This will be a very important case for us. And you will see the example there. So, okay, I'm a bit uh, short on time, sorry, but... Um, so I want to present a bit quickly how the formulas look relating moments and cumulants. And then I want to, um, in some minutes, explain the new part, because I think it's a bit more interesting. So, okay, these moment-free cumulant functional relations, um, I will show you how they look in an example, maybe directly. So 
we managed to find a very explicit formula. Okay, looks a bit complicated because here you have some sum over certain graphs. And uh, maybe we would need a bit more time uh, for you to understand this if it's the first time you see it. Um, but what you can keep in mind is that here you have the generating series of moments. And here you have the generating series of free cumulants. And this is completely explicit. And you can show that it's a finite sum. So it's just a completely explicit form. It looks a bit convoluted, but you can see in some example that it's not too bad. So here, for example, you can see this is one of the graphs that we are summing over. So it's an example for n equal to seven. We want to consider this type of bicolored graphs. So we want vertices that are um, black and vertices that are white and they have labels. And we associate to every hyper edge like this, so to, to every black vertex, we will associate uh, the generating series of cumulants of third order. So because it's this is valency three, this is third order, this valency two is second order and second order also have this correction over here. This valency four, it's fourth order. So the weight associated to this tree looks like this, okay? And then uh, here you can see the example for n equal to three. These are all the graphs that will appear in that sum that I showed you. And then, okay, you have to carefully look at all the definitions of this guy. So I will skip these details, but I will give you the final shape. So here you have the uh, four types of graphs that appear in the sum. You have the weights associated to these graphs in terms of the generating series of cumulants. You have the only two O operators that will contribute just because these sums will always be finite when you fix the type of graphs that you are working with. And then the formula for n equal to three just looks as, as this thing that is completely explicit. Okay, and as you can see, we just showed that the generating series of moments for third order is in terms of the generating series of cumulants of third order. And then cumulants of second order will also appear in here as corrections to this formula. Okay. So to prove this moment cumulant formula, we actually proved this for higher genus. This is what I told you already before. And the formulas look as before. It's just that the sum of graphs is a bit more complicated. It's graphs with certain cycles. It's not just trees. And then we specialize this formula to genus zero and we uh, recover the moment cumulant relations that um, were um, wanted in, in, in free probability. Okay, but this also allows us, as I explained before, to um, define this theory of moments and higher order free cumulants with certain genus corrections, with this notion of GN freeness that I explained before. So, okay, I want to illustrate this uh, in uh, one example. I want to finish like this. Um, which is hopefully interesting for, for this audience. We actually managed to compute uh, moments of, uh, um, so we have two uh, random matrix ensembles, A, N, and B, N. One will follow uh, um, a GUE distribution. We'll have a, a GUE distribution. And the other one will just be deterministic. So uh, here are the, the here is the precise setting. So we need uh, three parameters, S, L, and T like this. We have A, N is a random Hermitian N times N matrix with density, density law given by some uh, Gaussian. Here we just put a CN that will make this a probability measure. Uh, and then we consider B, N to be just a deterministic matrix in which we have eigenvalues. Uh, so we have Tn non-zero eigenvalues and the rest are zero. So we put ourselves in this uh, setting that is um, simple enough, but complicated enough to give uh, quite interesting results, but simple enough in such a way that we can apply all our theory very, very explicitly and compute everything. So I want to show you a bit how this works so you can have an idea of how you can get analytic properties out of this theory that we built. 
So if A n and B n admit a limit distribution to all orders, this is what I said before to what I answered to Jamie, that this is the case for many, many interesting cases. And uh, here with uh, see, here this is uh, this happens. I mean, this is obvious from uh, this is obvious for the deterministic one, and this is just from weak rule for the for the GUE one. Then we can use our result to show that these two ensembles are asymptotically free to all orders. And we can actually use our results to compute moments of all orders. So we can compute all corrections. And the, the origins of this particular example were already um, uh, in, uh, to, in, uh, in 72, uh, Pasteur computed the zero one moment. So just the moments at the time. Um, and then uh, this problem became more important because uh, Bake, Benoro, Spéché um, studied the phase transition des describing a separation of the maximum eigenvalue for deterministic parts of, of small rank. So, okay, it's an interesting phase transition that appears. Uh, maybe some of you know about this more than me, actually. And uh, this phase transition was studied quite a lot afterwards, in particular in these two papers using free probability. And our goal is now to compute the generating series of moments and actually the moments for the corrections 0, 2, 0, 3, and 1, 1. We can actually go higher, but uh, okay, for this, you already compute quite some important things. So uh, this will give you morally the variance. This will give you higher order correction to the variance. And this will give you higher order correction to the law of large numbers. So just the corrections to the first order moments. Okay, and the, the moments are just these guys that appear over here in the expansion for large n. Okay. So this is uh, this looks a bit technical, but actually getting the idea is very, very easy. Um, this allows this uh, result here tells us that we can transfer analyti analyticity properties from one side to the other. So what do I mean? I mean that, so remember, the Gs without the check uh, are related to the moments, if you want, and the ones with the check are related to the free cumulants. It turns out that if you have a Riemann surface in which you can actually analytically continue the series expansion uh, of the moments or the series and the series expansion of the free cumulants, and actually mm, more precisely, I have a Riemann surface and I have two meromorphic functions. This is related, of course, to the setting of topological recursion. So that's why we formulate it like this. So actually this guy, the generating series of uh, moments is a series expansion of this meromorphic function w. And this one is a series expansion of this meromorphic function x. This might sound a bit weird, but it's, this is actually what the R transform is telling you, that you can go from here to here. Well, if you have this setting that is quite familiar in free probability, it turns out that uh, if these guys, so this, these two things are equivalent, the, the analytic properties of uh, moments or free cumulants are equivalent. So if you know some, you can know the other by the formulas that we showed. So uh, what I mean is that uh, these guys will be serious expansions of a meromorphic function on our Riemann surface, even only if these guys are serious expansions of a meromorphic function on the same Riemann surface. So, okay, let me uh, finish by saying that uh, uh, how you can apply this to this uh, example of uh, GUE plus deterministic. So I, I just need a couple more minutes uh, for this. So I just want to say, so you understand uh, better the next slides, that this triple, the Riemann surface and X and W, we can call it spectral curve, as we as I said before. And we can actually formulate everything that I said in terms of these differentials that are related to topological recursion, but are also related to the generating series of moments and free cumulants, just like this. So these guys extend to meromorphic and differentials on the whole Riemann surface, even only if the check ones do. And this we prove using our general formulas that relate these two problems. So, okay, the idea is that uh, uh, in one case, so in the GUE case, 
uh, computing the moment is not trivial, but computing the cumulants is trivial. You can do this in, in many different ways, but it's very, very easy to compute the free cumulants and they are just non-zero in this very, very specific case. So the generating series of cumulants looks very easy. If we invert it, we get a Riemann surface and we can actually extend everything in this Riemann surface for, for zero one. And this will be the spectral curve of our problem. So it turns out that the generating series of free cumulants is zero for higher topologies. So of course they admit analytic continuation because zero is very, is very easy. And by our transfer theorem, these uh, generating series of moments also admit an analytic continuation. Then for the deterministic example, you do exactly the opposite. You can compute easily the moments. You compute the generating series of moments. You build your spectral curve. Uh, the moments are trivial for higher topologies because it's deterministic. And they admit hence analytic continuation. And then the opposite also admit analytic continuation. And then the last idea that I want to convey is that since we have asymptotic freeness, because we have unitary invariance for the GV, uh, we can actually just sum the generating series of free cumulants because free cumulants um, um, linearize uh, free random variables. So we can just take the sum of these two guys and this will be equal to the generating series of free cumulants of the sum um, uh, random ensemble. And then this allows us to build the spectral curve for, for the sum. And this allows us actually to compute the moments, the corrections that we want. So we can recover the results of Pasteur, we get the, the law of large numbers, we get subleading corrections to, to this uh, result of Pasteur, we also get the central limit theorem, so we can compute the variance, and we can also, also compute higher order corrections to this, like third order cumulants. Okay, this takes some work uh, of studying this, uh, the complex geometry of this uh, um, spectral curve, but you can actually do it. And uh, let me finish here, let me skip the constellations. Thank you very much for your attention.